in Ethiopia, so we have like my, my family, uh, we have six brothers and two sisters. And uh, my dad is Imam, so we have a big family. And um, one day we were surprised, you know, we walked to school from home to school. It was like probably half an hour. And then they surprised us, the military, they came with the, with the, with the van, just shot in the air, and all the kids run around and for a scare. I was just standing in the freeze. Mm. And some a friend of mine, kids ran away, and, and, and the military just shot them. And just, I see so many blood, and I see crying. And I just, I just froze. And then they put them in the, uh, in the van, and then they drove by. Wow. Yeah. And for yes. how many years were you captured as a child soldier? Yeah, I was uh, two years in the military. It, we were in the front. It's yeah. like there is no break. It just uh, it, training in probably like three months of training, the, how to shoot, how to survive. And we put us in the, in the front. And this is during the height of the Ethiopian Civil the War. Civil. This statement just gripped me in your book. It says, you know, you were told, if you don't shoot your gun at the enemy, yeah. we will kill you. Yeah. So every single day as a 12-year-old, you are fearful of your own life, yeah. that they will turn the gun on you. Yeah, it was behind us. We have to, we are in the front. So we have to shoot if we don't. Yeah. And then they're going to shoot us. So we have to just survive to, to, but, you know, just like we go in a day, a day without having prepared meals, mm. without changing your socks, and we're walking in miles, miles. And, you were able to flee with a friend after, as you said, two years. We went to Djibouti, mm -hmm. and they have a, a business people. They walk from Bourain and to Djibouti, and, and we ask them, "Come, come with them. You know, can we go with them?" And then we trade our gun to to go with them to Djibouti. And we stay in Djibouti, and we start away. The first start away was five young boys, and then and the captain he go from Djibouti to. Um, Israel mm -hmm. and then Israel they didn't take us in a refugee so they go next to destination you go to Japan mm -hmm. and captain just throw us in the water it was five of us and two of us we survive and then the second store away and then we I, I came back to Canada Montreal right yeah. and so tell me about struggling with alcohol and trying to drown all of those memories that you had as in Montreal, I meet a woman, we get married, and then I have a daughter, her name is Bethlehem. So I was drinking a lot, but I didn't see that much because I can't sleep. It's only I can uh, sleep by drinking and using drugs. Mm -hmm. It's only that's for my medicine, because if I don't drink, I go back to in the war. I go back to this nightmare. It's, it's, so for me, I, I found uh, to hide my past by out drinking a lot. Hide your pain as yeah. well. You eventually moved to the States where you join a gang. Yeah. Tell me about I le process. I left uh, Montreal when my daughter, she is three years old. I was, I can't be a good father. I can't be a good husband because drinking too much and we have a restaurant even. I just left her notice like, you know what, I, I can't do this. I can't do this to you guys because mm. for my daughter's sake and, uh, and to her. So. I left the north and I, I moved back to Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. I stayed at 10 years in Portland, Oregon. It's what I know, just in the street. And next day I know, become gang members, meet all the different people. It's just that. And then we got a lot of cocaine and drugs and gun. And just 10 years and just uh, being living in Portland, Oregon is a nightmare. In and out of jail and so many things. I got shot twice and yeah. it just. You also lost friends as I well. I lost a lot of friends. I have two of the best friends in, in Poland, Oregon, and the overdose. We're just sitting and just drinking and using drugs and die overdose. I lost two friends. So. You say that your, your drug of choice became cocaine. Yeah. And one day, I think you, uh, what you would say was your bottom. You hit bottom. You were in a trailer mm -hmm. infested with, mu with rats. Yep. Tell us this story. So I... I, I want to escape from gang members, so I had, my passport is expired. So I have to wait for my passport, and my cousin, a friend, his friend has a trailer, so that I have to sleep in that trailer for a while. And in that trailer, there was a lot of rot, and nighttime I go out and some hustling, bringing some drug, and just, it just until I get that passport come back. Mm -hmm. And then after I got my Canadian passport, and then uh, and take a bus and came back to uh, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So you're in this trailer, mice are crawling all yeah. over you. Yeah. 
you're strung out on drugs and finally you get your passport to come back to Canada and you land in the downtown east side of Vancouver, yeah. which is not the best place <laughs> for a crack addict yeah. to land. No, I was surprised when I get there. It's like everybody smoke outside. In yeah. Portland, Oregon, we don't do that. We're just uh, hiding. And, and then uh, and Portland, Oregon, I mean, Vancouver, I don't have anybody. I don't know anyone. I just get at Graham and then they have a man in, in terminal, they have a, under the bridge. Mm -hmm. I start sleeping under the bridge for a while. It's almost a year I sleep in there. Under, uh, under the bridge for yeah. almost a year you're sleeping under the bridge. Yeah. And, and so then you find this program at Union Gospel Mission. Yeah. And as you said, you had been raised a Muslim. Your, your father was an imam. Mm -hmm. But something that they said about Jesus really tugged at your heart. Yeah. What was it about that that changed your life? So, and one guy, he told me about Union Gospel Mission because they were hungry. It's just like uh, winter time. It's like, hey, we'll just go to uh, Union Gospel Mission. They have nice hot meal and food is good. It's like, okay, I walk there. And then the people it was nice. And before we go to eat, we have like uh, 20 minutes to have a preaching. The pastor mm -hmm. is coming and preaching and pray for the food. And then I was like, okay, this, and, and after even I finished eating, is a lot of Irish workers come to me. It's like, hey, if you have any uh, drug and alcohol, if they have any problem, we have a program here. Mm -hmm. So I hear that a lot, but I didn't sink in. I didn't think about that, but I heard a lot of about Jesus and, mm -hmm. and, and finally, one day I was in an SRO hotel and with this woman where I party for three days and, and she went to go back to the bathroom and then she didn't come back. It was like an hour. So when I go, I hear there's a lot of people in the hotel. When I go out, she's overdosed. She can't make it in my door. And then I just run. I run to UGM. That's why I know because I've been eating. I go and then I say, I'm not going to that bridge anymore. I'm going to stay in the UGM in the shelter. Mm -hmm. So I stay for a while. And Christmas Day was, I was crying to God. I said, like, God, I hear enough. I, mm -hmm. need, I need Jesus. I need in my life. Mm -hmm. And so you found, find Jesus. And, but then another addiction starts to pop up. And that's an addiction to pornography. Yep. Yeah, I finished the program, uh, the four months of program. And when I was in the UGM, I didn't deal with, with the pornographer. So I just did it for drug and alcohol, and my counselor is very nice. He just take me to childhood and just pray a lot of, and if, when I was at UGM, there's a lot of support and praying and, and talking. Mm. And finally, when I moved back from UGM, I have my own small room, and that's why I start from pornographer. So I, I have my own room, nobody see me, mm. and then I have my computer, it's just like it's starting. And, I know I, I have one year clean and sober, but I have to go to church and uh, baptize and everything. But that addiction is just struck me there. Yeah. Struck me there. It's like, I, I just, I was, I have a lot of shame when I go to church the next day because I step all night in to wash that dirty and then feel like, I feel like it's so shame. Mm. And then finally I, I was crying to God in my room. Mm. I said, God, I need help. I know I didn't give you this, this addiction. Mm -hmm. You delivered me from drug and alcohol, but I didn't, I hold on because I love this. Mm. So I was crying to God and fall asleep. And I wake up three o'clock in the morning, my computer is still there. And then I was look outside and it was second, second floor where I live, I pick up the old computer and just throw them in the, throw it out throw the window. The window. Wow. I have nobody there is there. In the, you know, and just finally I go clean up the, the area, clean up my house, it's no more. And then I would start talking to people in the programs like, this is like all the man, we have, we like to hiding in this addiction. So yeah. you don't need to be hiding. By opening myself, is a lot of people, they come to me and ask me a question. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, people help a lot by my testimony. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the enemy wants us to keep that shame inside. But you learned that by letting it out, by telling your counselor, by telling your pastor, yeah. you were set free. Yeah. Now, you, you, you're a pastor, you are married, you have a beautiful little boy named yeah. Adam. Tell us about life now for you, Jamal. Um, life is because when I was going to Broadway Church, I met my wife in Bible study. And, and uh, yeah, it just been, um, my life is, is very, it, with, with God is, is so amazing. Mm. I kind of explain. Um, there is sometimes I don't sleep and I'm struggling, but I have that hope. You know, God is only. I wake up in the morning, the first in the morning, go on my knee, and I say, "Thank you, God." Mm. You know, God. Yes, I lost everything, even my daughter. I didn't see her for 17 years, and and, and that's 
that's all the shame and behind. And God, he just gave me free and he gave me a new life. He's given me the second chance to be married and then have an Adam. Now, I, I used to be a lot of like in my past and, and beating myself. And now God, he delivered me. He set me free. I'm a new creation. Mm. So I have a new person. So I want to be better for my, for my son. So from a child soldier to a drug dealer to a gang member to, you know, addictions to sex and pornography to now a pastor and living free in Jesus. What would you say to somebody watching that might be going through a really hard time and feels like there is no hope? You see, is, uh, f for me, by telling my story, I want to give people for hope because yeah. it is a way out. It's only Jesus. You know, for me, it's the first one at that Christmas time. I was crying to God for my life. I said, God, I need you. You know, I was carrying that heavy load and, and back in so many years. And finally, Jesus, he set me free. Mm -hmm. I was living in the darkness. Yes, it is hard and addiction without God, without Jesus. But with Jesus, it's not going to be hard. Mm -hmm. It's going to be easy. It's going to be like wonderful. We have a hope in Jesus and walking beside me. Yes, sometimes I have, I have a hard time to sleep, but I'm not focusing that. I'm focusing ahead. I know where I'm going. Mm.